Good day, everyone. Welcome again to Come Let Us Reason Together, our weekly podcast and video file. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about the resurrection. As Easter approaches, I think that a lot of Christians always would naturally have the resurrection on their mind. And I have the express privilege of being joined by Dr. Gary Habermas, who's one of the foremost experts on studying the resurrection and all of the historical details that go into that. So I hope you'll enjoy this conversation I have with Gary next on Come Let Us Reason Together. Well, good day, everybody. Again, welcome to Come Let Us Reason Together. And today I'm really excited to have joining me on our podcast, Dr. Gary Habermas from Liberty University. Uh, Gary has made a life's work of studying the resurrection. And that has actually, interestingly, led him to other fields of study that you may not put together right away, such as near-death experiences, as well as dealing with issues of doubt and things like that. And we're going to talk about all of this today. So first of all, I wanted to welcome you, Dr. Habermas. Uh, good to have you on the program. We've we've ran around together at different conferences and such for a long time, but this is the first time I got to sit down and talk with you uh, kind of formally. So so good to have you here. Glad to be here, Lenny. Okay. Glad to do this with you. Yeah, and uh, of course, my first interaction with you uh, academically was with the book, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus, which you co-authored with Michael Lacona. Uh, You know, before this, we had things like um, uh, Josh McDowell's work and things like that, but this really kind of moved everything into a whole new level, the minimal facts argument and things like that. First of all, I know that for you, the case for the resurrection of Jesus, studying what historians and scholars have been doing and understanding from the historical framework has, has been kind of a lifelong pursuit. And I, I just wanted to have you, you know, let our folks know what was it that that drove you, that, that brought you to uh, study the resurrection? Well, it was my, my own doubt. The uh, three books on doubt that you kind of alluded to, and I did years later, were when I moved into a phase of trying to use this material to help somebody else to minister, because it's what everybody wants to ask about. If it's true, they know Christianity follows. Uh, Well, I found that out, too, when I started my doubting, and I realized that with the resurrection, we've got everything, and without it, uh, Apostle Paul said it, without it, there's nothing. So what launched me into it was the death of the closest person to my life in those days. Mm -hmm. And just a few years after my 40-ish, I mean, uh, uh, 20-ish years of doubt, uh, just a few years later, um, the wife and mother of my four children died of uh, stomach cancer. Wow. And so I think of my doubt as being framed by two bookends of death. And of course, Paul says in First Thessalonians that we grieve when people die, but not like unbelievers who grieve without hope. And I've thought about that a whole lot over the years. And there is a lot of difference between grieving with hope and grieving without hope. And um, I'm just, I mean, if you think about it, the straightest line from the resurrection to the question, so what follows from this? Hmm. The straightest line is the resurrection of believers. In fact, in Scripture, where the resurrection is linked to almost every major doctrine in the New Testament, by far the majority of times it's the resurrection of believers. Almost 20 times we're told that believers will be raised because Jesus was raised. So to me, that's a key event. It's just not the gospel. It's the yellow brick road that leads to the Emerald City. I mean, in a real way, Mm. uh, it leads to the kingdom. And so that combination, answering my questions 
and a path to eternity. That was what captivated me with the resurrection. I, they, my friends came alongside and said, how about all these other answers? Why don't you study everything under the sun, creation, <laughs> uh, yeah. archaeology, New Testament. And I just thought, I start reading it, and I thought, this stuff's baloney. And I, I didn't mean baloney like there's nothing to it. I knew there was something there, and some of the arguments were worthwhile. But I didn't think it was enough to hang your salvific hat on. But I realized the resurrection would do it if it were true. Um, yeah. It, well, it is central. And, and as you say in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul kind of hangs all of Christianity on the threat of the resurrection. So a absolutely. But And you took an interesting tack in this uh, because you approached it from kind of a historian's perspective as well as uh, doing a, a survey of all of the different scholarship data, I should say, that was out there, right? You started reading everybody, whether they were Christian, whether they were um, affirming the resurrection or not, you started reading what the different scholars were saying about this, these different accounts and how they would understand them both historically as well as maybe, let's say, religiously. And um, that became kind of an interesting avenue for you, I would, I would think. Yeah, I think I often say to my grad students, I spent more time reading the critics than I read the evangelicals. And most of my schooling was in secular schools. And my dissertation on the resurrection was at uh, Michigan State University. And it's not like our committees today where almost everybody has like three people on a doctoral committee. I had six people on my committee and they were evenly split, as near as I could tell, between three who believed in the resurrection and three who did not. Hmm. Interestingly enough, one of the three people who believed in it was a Greek Orthodox, was a Greek Orthodox priest with two doctor's degrees. And uh, he was one of the real pro guys, but I had some pretty critical con guys too. One of my uh, a Jewish historian on my team uh, was probably the most complimentary person of my dissertation, but he was a Jewish non-Christian, but he was very, very helpful. So those were formative days for me when I was getting this together and working with people who weren't really against anything I was doing. They did not make me add or edit anything in my 350-page wow. dissertation. You, wow. They had me adjust <laughs> one sentence in my three-page summary of it at the beginning. And what the sentence they had me add was a sentence that I had said twice during the dissertation. So I wasn't, you know, bothered by adding it. But all they wanted me to add was, I don't think this doc, I don't think this event is proven. I just think it makes the most probabilistic sense in historical terms. Okay. That's what they wanted me to add. And I'd already said it twice. I would never say the resurrection was proven. Well, it, so. First of all, I think it's amazing that you had a dissertation that actually didn't have tons of changes in it. That's, that's impressive in and of itself. But uh, yeah, maybe maybe they didn't get into it as much as I thought. <laughs> maybe they didn't. May, read maybe, much of it. but but you and again, you you said that one of the one of the folks sitting on the panel was was Jewish, and yet he was complimentary as to your approach. Yeah. So did this get you? You, you, you? you know what he said, Lenny? I can tell you, you'll get a real kick out of this one liner. We were doing the oral defense. Yeah, and the the Jewish professor of history, he said, he said, you've got some pretty good evidence for the resurrection here. I think it's kind of, um, I think it's, it makes sense. But I just have one comment. And I said, what's that? He said, you left out the main evidence for the resurrection, in, in my opinion. And I said, well, I would like to know your, your answer. I may add it to my study in the future. He said, okay. He said, you didn't say a thing about the Shroud of Turin. Ha! <laughs> that was way back in 1976. Wow. He made that comment. Two years before the major scientific investigation of the clock. That's that's amazing that, that, yeah. that he would give that much credence to the Shroud. 
That's a... yeah, and he was an historian. Yeah, wow. He thought he thought it should have been in there, and I didn't put it in there because of all the Catholic Protestant pull, give and take. I didn't want to bring politics. Um, I didn't want to bring denominations. I, I just didn't want that involved in the right, question. Right. But I told him I was real interested in what he said. Yeah, well, obviously, because... I'd, I'd already studied the Shroud. I'd studied the Shroud in, in much depth about seven years earlier. Okay. But I still didn't bring it up with the dissertation. Okay. And and do you think that after 1978, um, that, that scientific, uh, you know, expedition, if you will... Uh, changed the opportunity in the way to understand it. I know there's still controversy about it because you had some guys uh, who were just kind of coming in with a blunt force hammer, taking pollen samples and kind of just uh, not, uh, and others were trying to be a little bit more precise and careful. And, and there's a lot of argument about it. The shroud has been patched and did the carbon 14 dating come from the patch? And there's all this stuff that goes into it. So, so how how big do you think the shroud of turn plays in say 2023 as opposed to 1976? Well, a couple of comments. Just before we went on the air, a guy wrote a letter to me and he said, "I just fin-, he was British, and he said I just finished my bachelor's degree in archaeology at this British university, and I want to go on for a grad degree and maybe my PhD in archaeology." He said, what angle do you think I should take if it, in these archaeology programs, I want to do the Shroud of Turin mm-hmm. for my topic? I, I just wrote him the letter, and just pushed send before we went on the air. And, and I said to him, you know, among real intellectual guys who haven't studied it, the opinion is quite negative. But the, but the minute somebody picks it up and gets into it and reads the the scientific studies, dozens and dozens of articles published in peer-reviewed secular scientific journals, their view almost inevitably changes. Mm -hmm. But to show you where I left it, my first volume of this big four-volume resurrection thing I'm doing uh, was uh, almost 1,300 manuscript pages. And by the way, I just got my page proofs back, and it's almost 1,100 pages printed. Well, I was going to put an appendix in there because the first volume is on evidence. Okay. So I was going to put an appendix in there in the shroud. And the my the main guy, the uh, chief, the big man at the company, uh, one of many who have PhDs there, and all of the guys on my team, all of but one that are doing my my uh, manuscript are all have PhDs. Um, he said, it's up to you. You want to put an appendix in there? Do it. If you don't, no. And I had just been reading a prominent New Testament scholar who kept making derogatory comments about the shroud. Mm. And he said, and I'm not talking about the shroud. And I'm not bringing the shroud in here. And I thought, I don't want to make people question the historical data because they're wondering about the scientific thing. I think there's a time and a place for that. And I've published many things on the shroud. And there's many things on my YouTube on the Shroud. In fact, get this, the Shroud uh, interviews get by far the most hit huh. on, my, uh, on my YouTube site. So there's a lot of interest and there are a lot of big people. But the people who like it are not usually the New Testament scholars. They're usually guys who are trained in different scientific okay. fields. Oh, that's interesting. So what, so what you're saying is they look at the methodology and because they understand the methodology, they have more confidence in the result. Yeah, and 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 there, many of them are pro, a few are are con, but um, you got to study the data. The shroud guys are made up of a majority of people who started out very skeptically, and now are not only on board; it's become their major area of research. Huh. It has been studied. It has been studied more than any other archaeological artifact in history, secular or religious. Wow, that's interesting. I I wouldn't have or I, I wouldn't have thought that specifically. So so yeah, it's huge. And, and so you're seeing more people come to. Although it it um, I don't know. It 
it, it kicks up every once in a while, usually around Easter. You know, there's, there's, I find it fascinating how we, we hear about how secularized we are and things like that. Yet Time Books will always put out an Easter magazine special because they know that they're going to sell. And they'll always put out a Christmas magazine special because they know that they will sell. And uh, it, it seems that people want to understand this thing more. Uh, I don't know if some folks are just looking to have their their beliefs bolstered or uh, they just like the, the kind of the supernatural aspect of it. That, I think that might be part of it. But it is interesting that it, it attracts people. And the Shroud is, is kind of in that mystical enough category where people are seem to be attracted to it from a general audience perspective. That's true. And they seem that they'll interview a bunch of scientists and they'll give this compelling list of data. And then they all, it seems like they all like the resurrection. They always have to end with some skeptic as yeah. if to say, and that offsets all of this stuff and all of this, all of these data right. and everything else. So. Right. Yeah. It's there, 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 there's a, there seems to be a pattern in, you know, the uh, hidden secrets television specials that you see and things like that, or when they were unveiling Jesus family tomb and all these silly things that really are not scholastic at all. It's, it's usually they'll have a, an expert on there who will say something like, well, it could be that. And he raises one possibility. It's not even the best possibility, but it is a possibility. It could be that. And then usually right. the narrator will, will move from, it could be to, well, if that happened, then he strings along another ad hoc theory to couple with it. And he starts building a case based on all of these different ad hoc theories that are just, you know, this may be a 20% chance versus the 80% chance, but that seems to be the way they, they right. play Right, and that's about what it is because the guy, my co-author on two Shroud books, my co-author was the editor and spokesperson for the team that did the 1978 investigation. Oh. He used to work at used to be a professor at the Air Force Academy where the famous carpool started, where there were four of these guys in a carpool. And while they started going to work, they would talk about this and that. And they had some machines there at the Air Force Academy that could be used to look at the the uh, cloth. And um, he and I did this thing together. And it was, I mean, it was really good. I, I was on with him. His name is Ken Stevenson. And... Uh, like I said, I had studied I studied the shroud before I did my dissertation even, and I couldn't explain it. But the thing is, people who try to criticize it often send their research in to the scientists and they can test it on the machines. And it's ludicrous what the results of of it of the testing is. No, uh, nobody has come up with anything that's been that's declared to have a chance of explaining the image on the cloth. So it really is an enigma. Yeah, it, well, at least that. But let's go to, let's uh, turn our attention, and, and we may come back to this, Red, but let's turn our attention to the idea of the, the minimal facts argument, which is kind of something sure. that you pioneered. Um, so what you have done in your research, and by the way, 1,100 pages, uh, which is the first of four volumes, is going to that's be just, right that's the 1100 is the first of four volumes yeah, yeah. You, you, you craig keener says oh that's a nice start yeah <laughs> yeah well he called me on the phone he called me on the phone one day and he said how's that magnum opus coming and he's younger than i am so yeah. we were talking and i said craig when i grow up i want to be just like you absolutely and he's got this laugh that's just contagious and he bellowed out laughing and and then he said so how's it doing and i said well craig i have one hope in life and that is that my four volume resurrection book will be just one page longer than your four volume act famous acts commentary That's right. and he starts laughing again and he goes you go for it gary i hope you beat me you go for it well it won't just mine's going to come out at about 3700 pages in four volumes i don't know how long craig's is but he, i'm sure it's, it's longer than that yeah yeah it's and and all of the uh, all of the end notes and bibliography that was all relegated to cds it was all relegated to digital media because they couldn't print it it was he's 
Yeah, that one earlier book, not one of the Acts commentaries, but one of his earlier books, it's 800 pages. And if I remember correctly, 450-ish are research and 350-ish are bib. I, I, I don't know. I mean, he doesn't sleep. I just don't know how he's that prodigious. I just, it's amazing. But yeah, he writes a lot of pages a day, he too, does. which is beyond me, because a New Testament guy, I'm not putting anybody down. Uh, we need him, and I use them all, but the New Testament guys have to unpack data and they give their view and they just write. Somebody who does what I do on apologetics, you have to think about critics looking over your mm. shoulder for every sentence and you are forever going back going, now it could be this, but keep in mind that I'm also aware of that. Yeah. Or you have to use all kinds of words of nuance and everything else because the whole in the first volume, 1,100 pages, is all one big argument. Yeah. And you have to be so careful with the way you state it. And and so let's talk about that argument. So you sure. you took some time to, again, you surveyed thousands of yeah. present scholars as well as past scholars. And what were yeah. the conclusions that you drew from just this survey? Well, actually, you know, I was at a conference, uh, in fact, one of the ones you and I were together at, and I gave a plenary lecture on things I've learned from the first two volumes of my magnum opus. And I could have listed a lot more than this, but, you know, I had a time limit, and I stopped at 16 lessons I learned. And, I mean, I could I could rifle them off for you, but, but for example... The facts are hitting the critics hard, I think, because almost almost no new critics will take, fewer of them take any theory, but almost none of them will take a single theory and run with it, mm. as if they're so confident that they can make it stick. And they, I was debating a guy once, and he said, I said, pick a theory. I said, you're a naturalist. I'm a supernaturalist. I believe Jesus was raised in the dead. You're positive he wasn't. I'll tell you my theory. He was raised. What's yours? And he said, I don't want to get into this. And I said, why not? And here's what he actually said. He goes, you're going to get me in a corner. I'm going to be uncomfortable. And then I'll wish I'd never ventured a theory. And I said, oh, come on. Pick something. It's your view. You're a naturalist. And I couldn't believe what came out of his mouth. He said, all right. All right. Uh, maybe the disciples stole the body, which is like wow. the worst of the theories. And everybody will tell you it's the worst of the theories. And so I gave a bunch of reasons and he got angry. And he had been he was smoking a pipe, even though there were no smoking signs <laughs> over the doors. And he was smoking a pipe and he, he took the pipe out of his mouth and he said, this is what I thought was going to happen. I was going to give a theory and you're going to argue me into a corner. Habermas, as far as I'm concerned, this debate is over. And he wouldn't talk anymore. Wow. Isn't it interesting? So, yeah, because there, there, there is a burden for both sides. And yeah. it's easy to, to deconstruct using the modern vernacular. It's easy to tear things apart. But something has to be there. You have to explain the facts that we understand some way. And and so let's talk about what what are some of those facts. And in, in you normally, in the first book, Case for the Resurrection of Jesus, you lay out um, three plus two is the way you've kind of broken it down in, in, that, in that book. And the first one was that Jesus was crucified. And this seems to be pretty uncontested. I mean, there may be a few okay. Jesus mythicists out there, but but otherwise, um, crucifixion was so heinous, was so, it's, it's like, it's like, hey, I want to start a new religion, and uh, I'm going to put a pedophile as my, as my uh, focus, you know, it, it was that level of, of just uh, shame put on the individual. Yeah, I mean, John Dominic Cross and, and Marcus Borg, uh, two famous scholars, critics, and co-founders of the Jesus Seminar, they both say almost quotations of each other in their literature. Crossan says it this way, 
He says, I take it absolutely for granted that Jesus died by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. I take it absolutely for granted. And Marcus Borg says something very similar. Uh, Bart Ehrman gives 15 independent sources for the crucifixion within 100 years after his death. And, and Ehrman thinks, and it's fair, Ehrman thinks that 100 years after is a fair range to draw historical data. And in that range, he gets 100, I'm sorry, he gets 15 sources in those 100 years. So, it, yeah, it's very well accepted, the, the death of Jesus. Yeah. And then, so, Jesus died. I, again, We that makes sense because it was, it was a, a death reserved for slaves and reserved for the lowest of the low, the most wicked crimes that you can imagine. Jesus dies by crucifixion. The second point that you note is that the apostles had some kind of experience that at least they believed was the resurrected body of Jesus. And this, you say, is, is pretty overwhelming as well. Uh, yeah, I would say three things that are virtually unanimous among critical scholars are, number one, Jesus died on the cross. Number two, the disciples thought they saw him in some sense. And even some of the major skeptics, the big names, will say uh, they had some kind of visionary experience. They had some, saw something with their eyes that they thought was it was that. The third one is that Jesus' major message was the kingdom of God and how to get there. Oh. So, I mean, you know, Mark opens up. Jesus came forth preaching the kingdom and saying, repent, because the kingdom's at hand. So that and the crucifixion and the resurrection, the appearances are the three that people are just, scholars are going to give you. Now, of course, you have to answer what caused them to believe they really saw Jesus and be changed to such an extent. And uh, that's very, very difficult because, uh, as I was saying, Today, very few scholars will take a single naturalistic theory and stand on it. Okay, so let's let's uh, talk about a couple of others, though, that are are pretty strong, but maybe not as widely concluded. Uh, of course, the the biggest of this. Now, we haven't mentioned the the burial in a tomb yet because that's not quite as widely understood or widely accepted, I should say. Uh, Dominic Crossan, for example, held that Jesus was probably buried in a common grave, and there are a few others that are like that. But but it, there's still a pretty good consensus on this. Yeah. By far majority that believe Jesus was buried in a in a tomb. And uh, but I, but I tell people when I lecture, I'll say you know, and and the burial is not one of my minimal facts. But I would say I, um, it really makes no difference. Because if you, no matter who you are, you're an enemy, you're a friend, you're a disciple, if you steal the body of Jesus and take him to your house and you say, what the heck, it's a Saturday, I'll keep him here till Monday when everything opens again and I'll find out what's going on. I guess everything would open on Sunday, but I'll keep him here in the house. If Jesus was going to rise from the dead, he could rise from the dead in your living room. Mm. Your living room could, in a sense, be the, the tomb from which he, uh, you know, walked out of. So it doesn't really make any difference what happened to the body. If it was burned, it was burned in Gehenna, the, the pit there in Jerusalem where they burned garbage and refuge. If he was burned in the pit, uh, you know, a lot of people today uh, get eaten by jaws or, or, or die in a fire or other things and their body's gone or... They're buried in the dirt, and their body's gone again by the time of the eschaton. And whatever happens, you're not keeping anything from happening. So a lot yeah. of people think, wow, yeah, what if he wasn't buried in the tomb? I'd, I'd say, what follows from that? I'd say, nothing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> However, the Apostle Paul, who was a zealous Pharisee, in an era yeah. where um, adherence to the Jewish monotheistic God was pretty much sacrosanct, especially for folks from the Pharisaical tradition, had some kind of an experience where he saw the risen Lord and it completely changed him. And this is one of the points that you really lift up as 
hard to explain with any other theory, really. That's true. It's hard to explain. They're all hard to explain. That is why. That is why critics don't jump in there. And by the way, of uh, there were a few. There were several critics who have said have taken one theory. But amazingly, as I'm sitting here making these comments, and when I lecture on this lately, um, of the people who, of some of the people who have taken those theories, they passed away in the last two years. Hmm. So you used to have Garrett Ludeman and his hallucination theory. You used to have uh, John Shelby Spong, who had this, well, his theory goes by a bunch of different names. Nobody agrees on what it is. But um, I had a view about Peter had some kind of weird experience and convinced all the other disciples that they'd had it too, which, you know, wouldn't account for their transformation or anything. But he passed away. And um, uh, E.P. Sanders just passed away recently. Thing about E.P. Sanders is he called himself a liberal. That's his own moniker. And he specifically in his book on the uh, human figure of Jesus, he says a couple of times that the naturalistic theories have all been disproven. Hmm. Wow. But you would have a couple of guys who would take big theories and now they've moved on. And the younger guys, you I'm, now, now remember this whole thing. You mentioned the mythers. I'm not, I've read, I read, I read them, but the critics don't think much of them. Right. Bart Ehrman says about the mythers, he says, yeah. they're frustrated that the liberals don't take their views more seriously. He said, but they don't have a foothold in critical theory. And he says, in fact, they don't have a toehold. Yeah. So people aren't listening to them, but the, Bart Ehrman takes 20 pages saying what's wrong with him. The, the point I make it is I am only dealing with s reputable scholars. I don't care how liberal or conservative they are. In fact, usually I would rather talk about and cite and read the agnostics, uh, atheists, and members of other religions. Uh, I would much rather re read them. And they're the ones, I mean, um, one Jewish scholar, uh, Pincus Lapid, who had, interestingly enough, has a PhD, had a, he passed away, but had a PhD in New Testament. He said he was one of four Jews in the world with PhDs huh. in New Testament. He said Jesus was raised from the dead. Wow. He said the data, the data are sufficient to say Jesus is raised from the dead. And he says, so therefore, I'm always asked, therefore, do you believe that he is the Messiah? Now, that's an interesting question because the question presumes that if the resurrection is true, something follows from it. Right, right. And therefore, is he who he claimed to be? And Lapid basically takes a very popular Jewish view that's been around for over 100 years. And the view is that uh, Jews still come to God through the law. Everybody else in the world, Jesus is sort of a Gentile Messiah. Wow. Really interesting. So if you say there's 40 million Jews in the world, 40-ish million, that means the rest of the human population has Jesus for their Messiah, according to this view. It's a pretty popular Jewish uh, position. In, that, that's an interesting view. Of course, Judaism and the law rotate around the temple and temple worship, and it's pretty hard to execute that right now, with Gavin, given that there's no temple. So on the that's that's why you're that's why you're a liberal. That's why you're a liberal Jew. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because there's no, there's not much way to practice the right conservative. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an it's a problem. You know, I I wrote a, a chapter on using Hollywood to help illustrate aspects of of the Christian faith for Sean McDowell in his book um, Apologetics for a New Generation or a new gen a new kind of apologist. It was. I'm sorry. And one of the things that I did now, I I've never told you this and I'd be interested in your responses. I, I used Forrest Gump to talk about the apostle Paul and the resurrection. I'm saying, cause Forrest Gump was a, a popular film. Tom Hanks replays a lot of events from the 1960s and 1970s. Although Forrest Gump was written in the 1990s. So there's a good 30 year gap between when the movie was out and the events that he's talking about. And a lot of them are historical. 
Of course, Forrest Gump isn't historical. He's a, a fictional character that's kind of placed within all of this in order to make a point. And then I say, well, imagine a, a person today, say someone from the Taliban, say a high-ranking official from the Taliban who's uh, dead set on, you know, wiping out the, the devil that is America, watches Forrest Gump and believes that this man actually lived and changes his entire life because he saw the movie Forrest Gump and then, you know, converts to Christianity or converts to patriotic Americanism. Does that even sound plausible to somebody? Because really what you're, the Apostle Paul, it's kind of the similar situation where he's converted um, and he was so dedicated, but it, to put it in popular parlance, it just, I, you would have to have something absolutely game-changing in order for someone who is that set in their ways to change their mind and not merely stop pursuing and, and killing and jailing Christians, but to start making more. So that, to me, is just, just awe-inspiring. The, the strange thing about that is that the critics... Again, I'm talking about scholars who have terminal degrees in a field that's relevant to resurrection mm -hmm. studies. Bart Ehrman lists them as fields like theology, New Testament, mm -hmm. archaeology, classics, history. And you would be a person who's, if you if you mix that with studying it, you're worth listening to. And that's why when they get into these fields... They see the mythicists and they see some of the others as not having, like I said, Bart Ehrman goes off on a yeah, 20 pages. Yeah, dismisses them. And also the copycat theory, which is so popular among the mythers. We copied, we uh, copied Christian religion from ancient pre-Christian ideas. Bart Ehrman spends 20 pages on that, saying it's a total joke and scholars do not take these theories anymore. What's what's what happens is you're just eliminating the key theories that used to be the key theories against resurrection and today, which is one of the things I used in that lecture uh, in New Orleans, saying things I learned, uh, today, it's far more popular to, not to fill in the blank, not to say, Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, what really happened was, yeah. and fill in the blank. Today, it's far more popular for these skeptics to go, yeah, something happened. I'm not prepared to tell you what it is. Hmm. And that's where they leave it. Something really happened. And I would say that today, they're probably, I'm a head counter, but I haven't done this one. Uh, there are probably more scholars, again, qualified squal scholars in a relevant field. There are probably more who think that something happened to Jesus after his crucifixion actually happened to him than those who think nothing happened. Okay. Scholars with relevant de terminal degrees in these fields. And you know what? Uh, one of the fellows on my dissertation, when he was in, he was one of the, uh, like I said, there were three non-Christians and three Christians for what I could tell. One of the non-Christians on the team, we walked out of the oral defense and they had just conferred the PhD on me in the name of the university. And he walked out and he said, I have no problem with this. <laughs> he said, I think people see visions all the time. So again, he that's an example of a, I don't know what it was, but, but something happened that looks like Jesus himself might have been involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So without saying it was a resurrection or coming in. If you try to nail them down, they'll go, um, that's as far as I'm willing to say. And I'm thinking to myself, you betcha that's as far as you're going to say, because if you, if you go any further, your whole system will be up for right. grabs. So you stop there. Yes. So one of the things that's kind of intriguing to me, though, is your these kind of studies that you've done led you into a kind of a side investigation of near-death experiences and if they're even yep. 
and this is really was a, an initial response to objections to the resurrection account, right? Maybe Jesus, did, I don't know if it was Christoph Blake that you were looking at or, or something else, but tell me how you got into the NDE and, and what you've been finding there. Uh, uh, Lenny, I did not realize for probably a couple decades that I was, the reason I settled on the resurrection, of course I wanted to know if Christianity was true or not. And I was quite skeptical. I used to debate Christians, by the way. I used to say all kinds of wicked things about them and tell them that they couldn't know that the Bible was the inspired word of God, for example. And I went, went off on them. But I realized a couple decades later that because my doubt was framed by two bookend deaths in my life of the two closest people ever in my life, I realized that I studied resurrection because I was on a quest to know if there was an afterlife. I was on a quest to know if I would see them again. And I didn't realize that at the time. And as I said, there's a line, even New Testament, from the resurrection to the resurrection of the believer, almost 20 times, and it's the most, it's the most common comparison for the resurrection. And so it would just be natural that as I'm doing NDEs, I mean, I'll give you an example. If I'm studying creation, and that's my life's work, creation, and all of a sudden somebody comes out with stuff that we now call intelligent design and fine tuning, of course I would want to look at it and they would say, well, why do you want to look at that? If, if those fields tell you there's a God, you don't know which one it is. It's not worldview specific. And I'd say, yeah, that's true, but fine-tuning intelligent design helped me to encapsulate creation in my own mind. Okay, that's very similar to resurrection. NDEs, I don't think they're miracles. I think they're supernatural somethings from a, another world, mm. but I don't think they're miracles, and I don't think they tell you which, Christian, which religion is true, very much like intelligent design and fine-tuning and arguments for God's existence. Very similar to natural revelation, natural theology. So... I started studying NDEs because, again, my underlying reason was, is there an afterlife? Okay. I, I want to know who was I going to see and, and, and would that be true for me and to settle my own quest for, you know, life after death. So that's where the NDEs came in. But I realized that I was studying them. It's a strange backdoor to resurrection because just like, to use my example, my analogy, just like intelligent a design or fine tuning is a nice back door to letting you argue for creation mm -hmm. of some sort, some theory, the truth of NDEs would make you look back and say, well, all you guys who don't believe in the resurrection, because you don't believe there's another world like this one, uh, these NDEers, they apparently went to another world. Mm -hmm. They're screaming at the doctors who are pounding on their chests. And they're saying, leave me alone, leave me alone, I want to die. Having seen this, I don't want to come back. And they're screaming this. And all of a sudden, they're back in their body. They were resuscitated. And and they pushed the hands away. And the doctors say they were downright angry. I thought I was doing a good thing. They were somewhere where nobody could hear their voice. Just another realm. Hmm. And if there's another realm, I think that gives a real jump start to the resurrection. If we already know there's an afterlife, why are you objecting to a specific example? Okay called the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. And so to me, it, com it comes together very nicely. So it's a, it's a little bit of a controversial area too, because I think that, that there's folks who will say that there's, uh, there's a lot of kind of, there are certain accounts that can be dismissed. You, you know, I, there's objections like the 90 Seconds in Heaven book that seems to be more coercive. There's folks like Marianne Williamson, who seems to put forth a very Mormon specific um, aspect to it, and and so so those kinds of objections come come through when we were talking about this as well. And what do you what do you say to the folks like that? Well, I think there's a lot of, and Christians need to be added here too. I think there's a lot of false interpretations. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of sort of neutral interpretations where we just don't have the data. You can't say Mormonism is true because of this, but you can't say Christianity is true 
because of Indies any more than intelligent design or fine tuning or arguments for God's existence. We forget that it was Muslims who formalized some of the best known arguments for God's existence, like the Kalam yeah. argument. And I think they would say it was it was Islam. So but it doesn't it doesn't show any argument. It just shows like a category. So what I often say is with NDEs, it's all religious people who believe in an afterlife standing to shoulder to shoulder saying, here's the only thing I know. A, there's an afterlife and B, naturalism is mistaken. OK, and that's the benefit so, of these, just like ID and God's existence and intelligent design all say similar things. This is true, but naturalism's out. Right. This is true, and naturalism's out. Naturalism's always the one out. And I just saw a publication just days ago uh, that was saying the odd thing about atheists is that is that Dawkins calls them the brights, and he <laughs> calls them like they're brilliant and all this stuff, and they don't have a. And the guy was saying they don't have a single argument to prove their position. Yeah. They don't have a single empirical argument to prove their position. And yet they claim it's the most intelligent view in the universe. But what do you need? Evidence. And where do you have to go? The, this phrase today that's so famous, we have to go where the science leads. Well, you're not going to atheism from science because there's no direct connection. There are no scientific arguments for it. So I think they're, in the, I think they're the losers. And I think arguments for God, intelligent design, fine tuning, near death experiences, don't prove a religion. But they prove a reality that leaves out the atheist. Well, I, yeah, I, th I also think that it's it would be, a, and this is true of any movement that starts to gain in popularity. You're you're going to have the charlatans come alongside. It reminds me of Elaine Pagels in the Lost Gospels. Is you know, the fact that the New Testament had a stringent level of acceptance. It, you, we just didn't take in anything that called itself a gospel. You know, it was you, you, the fact that there were counterfeits and, and those were rejected. That's actually a good thing. But to not expect people to try and jump on the bandwagon and create their own thing, that seems to me to be naive. And similarly with near death experiences, just because you may have quite a few who either sincerely or insincerely are mistaken, um, misinterpreted, what have you. That doesn't necessarily invalidate some that have That's really true. compelling evidence, and and uh, you know the, right. the the red shoe uh, story is I think the most popular yeah. of that. And, and that the red shoe story, it's a blue shoe oh, story blue shoe. too. Okay, both on top of a hospital, uh, in opposite sides of the country, one in Hartford, Connecticut, and one in uh, Seattle, but. Uh, whatever view you take of these, those are baby evidential cases. There are dozens of NDEs with more convincing evidence than either one of the tennis shoe cases. Huh. In fact, there have been, to my knowledge, there may be way more now, as of six, seven years ago, there had been over three dozen cases of NDEs where, according to the machines, According to the machines, the person was flat heart, flat brain. And they produce phenomena maybe a mile away sometimes, maybe down the hall in the hospital, which is probably just about as good, or another, another floor that's corroborated. But they tell people the minute they come to. And I think when your brain and heart are apparently not working, you know, you know what is odd about that heart and brain not working? Atheists for years would say, when anybody said anything about afterlife, NDE or anything, they'd go, yeah, well, the nervous system is still working. And as long as the central nervous system is working, this or that could still be functioning. It could be human error coming from right. a diseased brain that is struggling to find life when it's dying. Yeah. They always say that. And that they still have brain and heart waves. Then when you present cases that have simultaneous brain and heart death as far as we can measure, they start going, well, that's only as far as we can measure. What if there's a bunch of it that we can't measure? But they wouldn't have argued that years ago when the shoe was on the other foot. Now it's the best evidence for NDEs, cases of evidential cases during those states. They don't like it. 
And they go, how do you know you can touch the machines? Well, and just to remind you, this is the same machine you trusted in your 1989 debate mm -hmm. at such and such a university where you said, we've got the machines, you know, and now you don't have them. And all of a sudden you're an enemy. Seems to me you go, you go wherever you need to, to deny and strangely enough, you have no evidence just for your position. Yeah, it's definitely special pleading. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And very much special pleading. And they say, again, the phrase, you got to go where the science leads. They don't have any scientific data. Uh, you know that these NDEs, they have, there's one guy alone. He's probably the leading uh, NDE expert, Bruce Grayson, um, good friend. But Bruce uh, just retired as head of brain, brain science at University of Virginia Medical School. He's a psychiatrist. Bruce has published 100 articles on the on NDEs in peer-reviewed medical and psych journals. Hmm. Over 100. People don't even know where to find these because they're not looking. Yeah. You know. And one group of doctors just estimated that between nine and 20 million people have had or claim to have had near-death experiences, 9 to 20 million. So you can't claim, oh, there's a few idiots out here who say, saw some funny things when they died. How about 9 to 20, 20 million? Wow, so. absolutely. Yeah, so it's also fascinating. And, and as you say, you kind of, you can actually put it together into kind of a cumulative case as well to show that, that the Christian understanding of life, death, of the resurrection of Christ, it all kind of works together. And I think that's that's the primary yep. goal. Yeah, yeah. So, well, just think, where you, just where think where you've gone on this call. We've talked about when when people say, "Are you the guy that's written two book, co-authored two books in the shroud?" Yeah. Are you the guy who's done this major article with Blackwell Journal, giving uh, five categories of empirical evidence for for NDEs? I am, and, and I'll say this: that was, you know, are, are you the guy that does this? Well, the funny thing is. I'll, I'll say to them, I'll say, hey, don't, don't worry about me. The Shroud and NDEs are the only two kooky subjects I ever get into. I don't think there's anything to the rest of yeah. them. But those two, you ought to check them out. That's what that's what I'll okay. say. They're my only kooky subjects. Uh, you know, it, it, now the Shroud would evidence Jesus if that argument works. Right. In the NDEs do not. But as good as the argument for the Shroud is, I think the argument for NDEs is far stronger. Okay. Well, we'll we'll put the links to um, your books and some of the resources as your website uh, below this video, so people can can get it when they're uh, looking. Sure. That would be great. And and then then let's bring this all the way back. Then, so you started this whole quest because of doubt, and you've actually done some work now on doubt, and you help other Christians who have either doubt within themselves, doubt within their faith, uh, or just struggling to kind of feel like they're keeping their head above water. How has that helped you to reach out to others? And, and what would you tell Christians who are who are struggling with doubt right now? Well, actually, it got me into an area that I never liked. When I was in college, I couldn't stand psychology. And, and as I started talking to doubters, and I've had thousands of conversations, um, the data show that most doubters doubt for emotional reasons, not factual reasons. The mm -hmm. factual folks, you just pile on the facts, and if they're truly factual doubters, as Mike Lacona did one day when he was when I per first met him and he was going through his doubts, he he just went, "Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. Thanks, Doc." And he turned around and walked out of my office. That's how factual doubter responds. Data. You know, Mike, I think Mike Lacona could go pro on doubting, actually. I think he's good at that. <laughs> so. got, well, you know what? He went through his own time of doubt. Yeah. But that day, it was a factual doubt. The majority of doubters are emotional doubters. So I had to go back and learn and study. And I got to study under Albert Ellis, the famous atheist uh, cognitive, cognitive uh, specialist in psychology, uh, David Burns, some of the very well-known people. I went back and studied into these guys and and uh, learned how to use techniques that dictate the cognitive species of psychological views tells you how to tell your emotions where to get off. 
That's C.S. Lewis's phrase. Lewis says when you're having doubts, you can't be a good atheist with doubts. You can't be a good Christian with doubts. He says you have to learn how to tell your emotions where to get off. And I, so I switch and I'll say, giving you 20 evidence for the resurrection, I'm just telling you right now, it's not going to do the job. You'll be on top of the cloud tonight, be 80% on top of the cloud tomorrow, 60% on top of the cloud the next day. By next Monday, you'll be in my office um, because you want to talk about doubts. You have, to, you have to teach a person how to control the what ifs. What if there's this? What if there's no that? And it bothers a lot of people. So you have to teach them to control what they say. That really, really works. So I went back, and because most people I deal with are hurting, by the way, the fact that their doubt hurts shows it's not, factual doubt doesn't hurt. Yeah. Uh, psychological heart uh, doubt hurts. You know, there's, there's, you know, what if I'll never see my mother again? You know, kind of questions. And there are really practical things. If just like resurrection leads to NDEs, resurrection leads to having some good reasons to control our doubts, but we also have to teach them how to corral those doubts and get them out of the picture rationally. Yeah. And now I understand that Ellis's and other methods, other cognitive methods, they're being taught in medical schools, wow. especially now that they've discovered that the leading medicine for depression and anxiety uh, may not have an empirical basis because they've discovered that a number of the people who have anxiety or depression um, can have, the idea was they're, they're, the chemicals in their brain that control that are on short order. Now they realize from, you know, we're more advanced in science and these folks are not short of those chemicals. So now why are we giving them the chemicals and think it's gonna yeah. heal them? So because we're in a little bit of a dead end there, what's coming in is this cognitive thing, which is teaching our uh, emotions. I love Lewis's words, how to teach our emotions where to get off. Oh. That's 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 great. That's good news, right? That's that's the whole point. When we talk about the hope that is within us, it is not the hope that we're going to live to borrow a phrase, the best life now. It is the hope that in the life to come that right. doubt, sin, suffering will be vanquished and we will have a a better life, a, a more fulfilling and uh, complete life as we experience the risen Lord in all of his splendor. So, yeah, ab absolutely. By, by the way, I would say once you know the future's lined up forever, go back and you all of a sudden realize that the present becomes more meaningful. So it does more for the present as well as for the future. What I mean is it's the best way to live life is to be sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Gary. I appreciate it. It's always good talking to you. It's always good hanging with you. We normally hang out together every January at least, and maybe sometimes in November, yeah. but um, looking always forward to that. Uh, hopefully you and your family will just have a, a wonderful Easter holiday, and uh, I just appreciate the thank time. You. you as well. Have a good one, Lenny, and thanks for the interview. Okay. I uh, appreciate being on with you. Yep, you're always great. All right, thanks, Gary. We'll talk to you soon. Right. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for watching this Come Reason video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like these, consider subscribing to our Come Reason YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. And you can follow us on social media. Lastly, if you'd like to help keep these kinds of videos free, consider providing a donation by clicking on the donation button beside me. Thank you.